Don't you turn that tile, don't you turn that station, because if you do, you're going to miss a really, 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 really good show. Our guest this evening is Ramesh Panuru. He is a senior editor at National Review. He's associated with the American Enterprise Institute. He is a fellow. Most importantly, he's a fellow at the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. The director of that establishment is se former senior advisor to Barack Obama, David Axelrod. In this show, you're going to find out so much. You're going to learn about Obamacare. You're going to learn about the Republican alternatives to Obamacare. You're going to learn about who the likely presidential nominee for the Republican Party is in 2016. And you're going to learn the essence of the conservative movement in 2013. The show is being taped on December 3rd, 2013. We're coming to you from the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. That's in Hyde Park, Illinois. Don't you turn that dial, because if you do, you're going to miss a really, 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 really good show. You're watching Public Affairs. Berkowitz is my name, and politics is our game. This is sort of an unusual start to our show. One, we're taping the show from the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago in Hyde Park. And two, um, and two, the start of our interview, due to some technical problems and logistical problems, we lost the initial part of our interview with Ramesh Panuru, when he outlined some of the problems of Obamacare, I think it would be fair to characterize uh, what he said as, do, as some of those problems are that the Obamacare program doesn't really take advantage of free market incentives for consumers and producers in the same way that a free market program would. Uh, Obamacare is not as decentralized as a free market plan would be. And so those are just some of the problems, and he uh, went through that in somewhat more detail. And when we joined this interview in progress is when Ramesh turned to the problem that Republicans might have defining who their national leader is, a problem that's always, uh, always plagues a, pro a party that's out of power because the president for the other party is the national leader. And then also, and also what are the alternatives to Obamacare that Republicans are offering? Ramesh goes into that in some detail. Enjoy the show. Yes. Who would you say is the leader of the Republican Party now? Is it the Speaker of the House, Mr. Boehner? Is it somebody in the Senate? I guess not, because they're in the minority. Is it Mitt Romney because he ran for president? Probably not. Who is it? Uh, a party that does not have the White House, it doesn't have a leader. And I think that that is uh, the case with the Republicans now. And, and I think uh, until a nominee emerges uh, until somebody has locked up the nomination sometime in the spring of 2016. Obviously, this is something that comes with ups and downs, um, the fact that you don't have a leader. Uh, and it, But it's, I think, inevitable, and it's just something that we have to deal with and but work you, with. So should there be an alternative to Obamacare that comes from the Republican Party? And if so, who nominally should be offering that? Should it be the Speaker of the House? I think it is less important that the Republicans unify behind an alternative proposal, although I think it would be good if, if they did behind a good alternative proposal, then that almost all of the Republicans have an alternative. They don't all have to have the same alternative, but I do think that there has to be a way of credibly saying that Republicans have solutions that would get coverage to millions of people without the costs, without the coercions, without the threat to medical innovation that Obamacare poses. So which Republican, or is there a Republican out there now that has, a, has an alternative that you would think would be a good alternative to Obamacare? Well, I don't think that any of these alternatives are quite where they need to be, uh, but I think there's been uh, some progress in the right direction. And there's also, um, there are some Republicans who have uh, advanced credible plans. I think Paul Ryan, he didn't get the entire House Republican Conference on board, but he does have his own plan. John McCain has had his plan. Tom Coburn has in the past offered plans. Richard Burr, uh, senator from North Carolina. So there are a number of isolated Republicans, some of them quite influential, who have had plans. Um, and again, I have my concerns about all of these plans, um, but I think that there's been uh, some positive movement. Um, if you look, for example, at the Republican Study Committee, the 175 conservative House Republicans, they recently came out with their own plan, which I think um, uh, is, again, uh, a step in the right direction. So which of these various plans, you said it's important that Republicans, that many Republicans have plans. They don't have to unify behind one. But if you had to 
give one of the ones you refer to, which one do you think would be closest to the one that would be best in terms of policy and two, most saleable politically? Right. Well, I don't think that they're there yet. Um, I think is there anybody, though, that you – is there any plan out there that you could talk about? Or should I ask maybe, Ramesh, do you have a plan that you want to talk about? Well, let me, let me put it this way. Uh, the Paul Ryan plan, which is also the John McCain plan, uh, I think is, has a lot of great features. And the most important of these is it changes the way health insurance is treated by the tax code. So right now, there's an open-ended tax break for employer-provided coverage. And the tax break is more valuable the more expensive your coverage is. So there's no incentive to economize. And what Paul would do is flatten that into a tax credit. So you get this credit regardless of how much your health insurance costs. If you choose a more expensive option, you pay that difference. If you choose a less expensive health insurance option, you pocket that difference. Um, where I think that Congressman Ryan goes wrong is that he is a little too disruptive to current health insurance arrangements, uh, that he wants a sort of big bang uh, movement to a new freer market um, that I don't think um, the public would really bear. So I, I would like a more gradualistic approach. Well, one of, the, one of the main problems that I think people referred to before Obamacare when they said, what's wrong with the healthcare system, was the problem of pre-existing conditions. And as most would know, that's simply when somebody wants to buy insurance, but they have a pre-existing condition. Obviously, the insurance company can't insure you for that because you already have it. And they could have been very responsible. They could have, from the time they were 18, bought insurance. They may have suffered a heart attack, got cancer. While they were on a group employer or employee plan, they generally could not be terminated. But if they left their job and then sought to find an insurance policy, now having that pre-existing condition, they couldn't find one. Or if they could, it would have been prohibitively expensive. I think most would agree. If I said anything that you would disagree with, and if so, if you don't disagree, what would be your proposal to deal with pre-existing conditions? Right. Well, first of all, recognize that the problem, which is a real one for a, uh, a discrete segment of the population, uh, is the result of the kinds of government policies we've had that have uh, distorted health insurance markets. Um, in, in a functioning market um, that where you didn't have the kind of heavy um, federal uh, encouragement of employer-provided insurance, it would be much easier for individuals to own their own insurance policies. And uh, in a more in a situation where you had a national market in individual insurance policies that wasn't as stunted and misshapen as our current one, thanks to federal law, uh, it would be easier for people to get renewable policies. So, but what do you Catast renewable catastrophic policy? Okay. So, you move to this new system where you are allowing a market the tax credit system you're talking right, about yeah. renewable catastrophic policies to be sold. Now, there's still the people who we already have. Um, who the current system has failed. And they're now essentially uninsurable because they're already sick. You can't insure them against the risk of getting sick because they're already there. So I, I think the thing to do is you don't pretend that you're going to insure them. You give them money to help pay for their medical costs. Uh, and what that means is you have subsidized high-risk pools. Um, and you design them so that um, they offer that help they don't create an incentive for people not to get private insurance coverage. And over time, you'd expect that that subsidy would decline because you're allowing this new market to develop where people don't find themselves falling into this problem in the first place. And you would say it's less distorting than the current Obamacare system. I suppose you would say this. Because currently what Obama does, or his Obamacare does, is take care somewhat of the pre-existing condition by lowering the cost tremendously for people with pre-existing conditions, but essentially taxing other people who don't have such conditions. So it raises the cost of their insurance, but it does so selectively, as opposed to if you had a general tax, all of America or all of America without pre-existing conditions then would be paying for, I think, under your system. Yeah, th there's no good reason, I think, to hide these subsidies and funnel them through the larger insurance system. There's no good reason... Uh, for taking this admittedly real, significant problem for a discrete and s relatively small group of Americans and reworking the entire insurance market 
uh, in order to work around that problem. Is that and that's what I think Obama It seemed does. to me, maybe I've got it wrong, tell me if you disagree, that the main motivation, I guess, for people, not necessarily for the president, but for people who thought something had to be done about the health care system in the last four, eight, 12 years, pick it, it was that, one, we had a pre-existing problem, and people think we're sympathetic to that, especially people who had pre-existing conditions, but they had a neighbor, they had a relative, they had a friend, and it did seem very fair if you, unfair, you know, if you happen to, you sort of lose the lottery. You have a child born with a severe chronic condition, that's a pre-existing condition. You develop one. So that was one problem that to handle. The second was there are a lot of low-income people who I think people legitimately felt they would like to assist those folks. People are trying, they're working, they're not able to cover all their costs. So perhaps a subsidy of some type. I would guess pre-existing conditions might be less than 5% of the population. Low-income individuals I've described maybe 20% of the population. So did we adopt a major program of revamping the whole healthcare system to address a problem that probably 25% of the public incurred? Or am I wrong on that? Is it much broader? I, I think that's that uh, you're on the right track. I think it's not even so much low-income people who already qualify uh, for Medicaid, but if you're above that income threshold, uh, but you don't have an employer plan, you might still have a problem. So the two things that I think really motivate, um, you know, your average person who supports Obamacare or who at least um, uh, thinks it has some good features to it, they're uh, the problem of people with pre-existing conditions who can't get insurance, and then just the larger problem of people who don't have insurance because they uh, they don't have access to a company plan. All right, we're going to shift. Maybe we'll come back to healthcare, but I want to I want to take advantage of should say you're usually not here. We're, we're taping the show at the University of Chicago. It's your last seminar, last day as an as an Institute of Politics fellow, right? Correct. So where are you usually? I'm based in Washington, D.C. DC. Okay. So, and you, and, and you were a senior editor of the National Review, is that right? That's right. And I, and I work out of the American Enterprise Institute uh, where I'm a visiting fellow. All right. So you know public policy. You know politics. You keep very aware of this. Looking ahead to 2016, who are the realistic presidential candidates for the Republican Party? Well, uh, depends on what you mean by realistic. If you mean by uh, if you mean people who could make runs and win some primaries, um, that's a different uh, question than people who could ultimately actually win the nomination. Right, the latter. Let's we're not going to screw. We're not going to fool around right. here. We're going to go for the people who actually could be, in your view, could win the nomination and you know, people who probably you would favor as a Republican right. candidate. Right. Well, I think the people with the best shot at the nomination right now are New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, uh, former Florida Governor Jeb Bush, uh, and, uh, and I think much lower in likelihood, uh, Senator uh, Marco Rubio from Florida. And, and you would exclude Cruz, Senator Ted Cruz, at this, at this moment? Well, uh, I should preface anything I say about uh, Senator Cruz by noting that he's an old friend of mine. Uh, I don't think that he is the likely nominee, although I think he could do very well in a lot of primaries, simply because, as far as I can tell, he would be running on a strategy of uh, trying to get consolidate the rightward third of the Republican primary electorate and then build outward. And uh, although I think Ted is very talented, person, I've not seen that sort of strategy work uh, in any of the primary races um, from 88 on. All right. So of the four you mentioned, you mentioned Rubio, you mentioned uh, Jeb Bush, you mentioned Chris Christie and Scott Walker. Of those four, if you had a bet right now, who would you bet on? I would bet on Chris Christie. Okay. I think Chris Christie has had a better 2013 than Mitt Romney had a 2009 or than John McCain had a 2005. I think he's really consolidated his position as the establishment favorite. Now, some say, you know, and so certainly some of the more conservative conservative uh, folks in the Republican Party, he's simply too moderate. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, Chris Christie is uh, well to my left. Um, but let's think about who the actual winners of Republican nominations have been in the past. Chris Christie has nothing in his record comparable to Mitt Romney's past support of abortion or his health care plan in Massachusetts that included an individual mandate. 
He has nothing comparable to John McCain's leading role with comprehensive immigration reform, his opposition to the Bush tax cut, his advocacy of cap and trade, and one could go on and on. It seems to me that the list of problems for Chris Christie uh, with the right are significantly smaller in both number and importance than the problems with those previous nominees. And obviously those problems didn't keep those previous politicians from winning the nomination. What's the most important problem that he faces from the right? What do you think the right thinks is the most important problem that Chris Christie has? At the moment, I would say the thing I hear the most about, is, to the extent I hear anything specific as opposed to just this general impression that he's too moderate, uh, is uh, the uh, embrace of President Obama uh, during Hurricane Sandy in the last days of uh, the 2012 presidential election. Was it also his fervor with which he advocated for the state of New Jersey as if there's some kind of God-given right that if a state has a disaster, has a problem, everybody else should pay for it? Doesn't that go against the whole conservative grain? I mean, maybe the state of New Jersey and states that are and they are somewhat hurricane-prone or disaster-prone. Maybe they should buy some disaster insurance. Should they all look just to everybody else? I think that... Everybody else in the country right. should pay for their risk. I think their that risk. Uh, you can make a, an interesting theoretical argument for that position, but the accepted practice has for many years been that when a disaster strikes a particular area, the federal government... So Chris, Chris is well within the re I don't, realm of reasonable... I find it okay. hard to believe people would, uh, would withhold the nomination for him. For it was that picture that of him hugging or overly embracing Obama. He could have been gracious and accepting aid. Did he go too far? I guess that's the criticism of him. Especially when Obama was looking for some sign of moderation, reasonableness. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that yeah. helped Obama in the presidential election, right? Uh, well, you know, one wonders whether it helped him or all that to, much, yeah, okay. but but it didn't hurt. Um, and look, he went a little further than I would go, but uh, at the end of the day, are people really going to uh, not just be against him for having been an effective advocate for his state, but uh, hold it so much against him that if he looks like he could be a uh, a winner, that they're going to say no? I, I have a hard time believing that. So who's the second runner-up between Walker, Rubio, and Jeb Bush, in your view? Uh, I would say, and maybe the, I'd give him the edge just because I'm more confident that he's actually going to run than I am uh, with uh, either of the other two. Uh, I would say Governor Walker. And why is it, what makes you so confident he will run? I just think, um, in the case of Rubio and Bush, they can't both run at the same time. Uh, I think their political profiles are too similar. Their backers are too similar. The I mean, Florida, the, the people, Florida, Florida, yeah, okay. Florida Republicans. Although isn't Marco Rubio is somewhat a little bit more conservative? Don't people one suspect that Bush is a little bit more moderate than they might like if you're conservative? And two, the Bush name may be a big drag. Rubio doesn't have either of those, does he? He doesn't, but uh, but Rubio has his own drawbacks um, that I that you know it's hard to balance against. For okay. example, Bush has had a position of executive experience, which Republicans usually value. Uh, and which the general electorate seems to value as well, and uh, Senator Rubio hasn't. Now, is Walker too inexperienced? I mean, he's only recently on the national stage, and he's, of course, the governor of Wisconsin, who I, I think the image would be, and you could tell me if I'm right or wrong, as substance. I think the image was he stood up to the unions and collective bargaining, the, the public sector unions. He stood up, and it seemed to succeed. Is that, that his main, the main thing that's going well, on for I would Scott say, Walker? I would say it's not only seemed to succeed, but it succeeded. And Is it succeeded right? both okay. at, at the substantive level and at the political level where the uh, Democrats, um, their base really wants to repeal his reforms, but the public doesn't, and the Democrats are having to straddle a little bit as a result. That is an indicator of the success of Governor Walker's reforms. Um, he, you know, he's going to have to develop a profile on national issues. He's going to have to show mastery of those issues, uh, but what he's done so far has been impressive. That is running a very blue state that last went for Republican presidential candidate in 1984 and uh, and successfully governing it. If he can win re-election. When is that re-election? The re-election is in the fall of 2014. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to is lose track of that. Is there any doubt? Have you kept track of that? Would, Do you know if he's got opposition I, I or strength? I would say he is, uh, I'd give him the edge over Mary Burke, I believe her last name is, uh, who is the likely Democratic nominee. But I would not say it's a given. I would say if you're a Republican one, one, running statewide in Wisconsin, 
it's never a given that you're going to win. What does he do in 2014? He obviously has to run and win re-election. The, 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 the broader the margin, the better. But does he also go around and try to you know, pick up IOUs, help fundraise for other candidates? Um, should he start getting into national issues? If you were advising him, what does he do in 2014? Well, I think that's a very tricky question because you don't want to be doing so much of that that your voters back home start thinking you just see them as a stepping stone. And I think he's going to probably be pretty careful not to do that. And if he doesn't, um, you know, go around the country campaigning for other people, I think that he's got a good explanation for that, which is he's got his own reelection at home to tend to and that he helps the National Republican Party by pulling Wisconsin in a, in a red direction. Um, to use the modern uh, way of coloring right. the map. Red um, for everybody right. out there, of but, course, is, is Republican, blue is Democratic. Somehow they've inherited those colors, I guess, right? That's right, that's right. I think, though, that he has to uh, find discrete ways of broadening his national profile so he's not just seen as the anti-labor union guy, um, because I think that's a, that is a potentially... Uh, a potential element of a successful appeal by a conservative candidate, but you don't want to be reduced to that. I think you've got to have a broader reform so message. So what would you advise him to do to broaden that national image? Well, I think I would talk about other places where I've been successful. I would talk about um, how uh, those labor reforms have affected public education in the state of Wisconsin. Is he a believer in school choice? And, uh, you know, that's a, that's something that I think the answer has got to, is, is yes, because he was the county executive, uh, and he's been the governor in a state with one of the most um, developed school choice programs around. The Milwaukee, in Milwaukee, right? School choice program that's been around for over twenty. So you years, think he's a believer, but now. it's so not I'm something. Sure. Yeah, okay. I, I'm not hundred percent sure, but I'd be, I'd be pretty confident. He should be going out there though, developing it. So you and I knew his position much more than we apparently do, right? That's right. It's not our fault. It's his job, right? Well, that's right. You know, uh, and he does have a new book out, um, Unintimidated, I believe it's called. I have not yet had a chance to read it, but I'm, I'm sure it goes into some of that. Have you had a chance to sit down and talk with him personally, one on one? Uh, in front of an audience, I, uh, I interviewed him oh, uh, at okay. one point, um, and uh, I spoke to him a, a second time in front. Uh, well, I was with a group of reporters, and I, I got to ask him one or two questions. And and the impression I get is uh, is one. Uh, I mean, I guess if there was one word that I would use, it's solidity. That there that he is not he does not strike me as a flashy guy. Um, but just as a very kind of solid citizen, which might be uh, in persona a nice contrast to the incumbent and also a nice contrast uh, to uh, to Governor Christie. Now, does he have what they call the gravitas to run for president? Does he have a presence? You were sitting here or talk, you know, talking to him one-on-one, -on -one, asking him some questions. Did it strike you had that presence? And also, does he have the TV personality? Two very important things, yeah. right, for somebody running for I office. think the question, uh, I think that's an open question. I think those are open questions, and they're, gonna, they're going to uh, do a lot to determine how successful he is. Let me switch over uh, to the conservative movement. I mean, you're involved in that. You write in this milieu. You've got a lot of friends, I'm sure, who are, what do we call them, conservative public intellectuals, people like Bill Kristol. I don't know, come to mind. Who else? Who are the other current idea people? Obviously, you're one. Who are your colleagues who are well, public are, intellectual idea <laughs> people? Conservatives. Uh, there are uh, there are a lot of... Give uh, me five or so. There are a lot of conservatives out there who are, are doing good work about um, what the future of conservatism should be and what our agenda should be. Uh, I think uh, Yuval Levin, uh, who edits a journal called National Affairs um, and has a new book out about the origins of left and right, is, uh, is a tremendous thinker. Uh, who's exerting a real salutary influence on the right. I think Ross Douthat uh, at the New York Times is a very smart guy who's had a lot of interesting things to say. Um, and uh, I think that there are many other folks. I think um, my colleague at the American Enterprise Institute, Tim Carney, has done a lot of work on the question of crony capitalism and how we need to uh, distinguish between the free market and things that are in the interest of politically connected businesses. So what, in your view, what is the essence of the conservative movement now in 2013? Well, I think that uh, the conservative movement has well-defined and articulated principles 
uh, that are the right principles, and those include a preference for free markets over government, for national strength and assertiveness, and for traditional values. Uh, but what is, I think, in question is how we translate those conservative uh, impulses and principles into a workable agenda uh, for the present day. And I think that's where the work has to be done. So is that the old three-legged stool that Reagan would talk about, economic strength, uh, military strength, and traditional family values? Well, yes, and I think, like I think that. those yeah. things are... So there's no change. I think we're back, the, right we're back, the 1980s are just as applicable uh, now as they were then. So when we talk about the conservative movement of 2013, we go back to Ronald Reagan. Well, I think circumstances change. Uh, the, circumstances, the applications are different. The circumstances of this country are not the same as the ones Reagan faced in 1981. And so our agenda has to be different from his agenda but they can reflect the same timeless principles. That, that really concludes our time, and I so much thank you. I'm going to close, but I need to ask you one thing. You are at the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago in Hyde Park. We are taping this here on December 3rd, 2013. Just give me your impression. It could be like 30 seconds. As a fellow uh, and spending time here at the University of Chicago, David Axelrod's mm -hmm. Institute of Politics, what did you get out of it? Well, uh, it's exciting to be part of the first full class of fellows and uh, to be in on the ground floor at the launch of a new institution. I've really enjoyed meeting these earnest, idealistic students and uh, helping them, uh, I hope, uh, see uh, conservatism for the first time in some cases and in other cases deepen their existing conservatism. I very much want to thank Ramesh Banuru. He, of course, as I said, is an institute uh, is, a, is a fellow at the Institute of Politics, University of Chicago. He's a senior editor of the at National Review, a well-known, long-standing conservative publication started by William F. Buckley? That's correct. Okay, many, many years ago, and you are also with the American Enterprise Institute, one of the best think tanks around conservative think tanks based in Washington, D.C. I hope you'll come out and see us again when you're here in Chicago. Thank you so much, Ramesh. You're welcome. Folks, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Ramesh Panuru. And I just wanted to add a few words about the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. You can find out more about it by going to politics.uchicago.edu. You can go to youtube.com slash public affairs TV and watch our recent show with Steve Edwards, who previously was at WBEZ, Chicago Public Radio, and came to the Institute of Politics about a Year or so a year or so ago, he knows more about interviewing public policy and public policy individuals and people and politicians than almost anybody I know. He's using some of that interview skill at the Institute of Politics. He's the deputy director of programming. It's a great show. Good opportunity to learn about the Institute of Politics. In essence, the Institute of Politics has this tremendous speakers program. People coming in of national renown to the University of Chicago to speak to students, faculty, and the public. Has a fellow program. Uh, fellows program that brings people in to conduct seminars primarily with the undergraduates but also open to alumni and members of the public at large. Everything is free. It's all fantastic and has a great internship program for interns to get involved in the Institute of Politics here locally but also work on matters with individuals around the state of Illinois and Springfield and elsewhere, Washington DC and other states. Go to politics.uchicago.edu to learn more about the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. If you want to become an intern and learn something about television and interviewing, well then just drop me a note, Jeff Berkowitz, and become an intern at Public Affairs and drop me a note by sending an email to jbcg at aol.com. See what we do by going to youtube.com slash publicaffairstv and come back next week and every week to Public Affairs.